Judy, are you a little cold? I am just a little chilly, but I have this Garden Time blanket to keep me warm. And we have something to warm you up. A new episode of Garden Time. Welcome to Garden Time. This new Garden Time blanket is one of the newest items at the Garden Time store on the Garden Time website. You know, and speaking of bringing the heat, we're out here at Little Baja with some great high-fired pottery. Later in the show, we'll be talking to Jared about pinatas. And also, coming up in the show today, we'll be talking about fuchsias that come back year after year. We'll also be talking about boxwood blight and what you can do to take care of it. But coming up first, contrasting colors and textures. Well, you know, at Garden Time Segments, we love talking about plants, 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 but then how do you put it all together to make it interesting and beautiful in your landscape? I'm with Rick Naylor from Visual Scaping and French Prairie Perennials. And so Rick, you are a master at doing this. And so you're gonna give us some tips that we can take home and make beautiful gardens and landscapes. Right, well, the first thing that you need to, to remember when you're, when you're, particularly if you're doing a smaller yard, is to try to make every plant count. Ah. Okay, and the way that we can do that is by using color and texture together and by staggering our plants, particularly if you have a, like most people do, a square backyard. If you can take your plants and stagger them instead of putting them in a straight line, then you can get the plants to play off of each other, which is really important because then every plant will count because they're working together. Ah. And so let's talk, first talk about texture because you mentioned texture. And so you have this little vignette here. So what's going on with these three plants? Now we've got three different colors which is nice, but the problem is, as you can see, they're all the same texture. So you kind of lose some of that pop because they blend together more because of the texture. Uh -huh. So using different colors is great, but really concentrate on using some different textures too, because that gives you more of that pop that you okay, need. Okay, so let's go down to so. this landscape, which is filled with color, texture, all kinds of different things. So kind of explain what you, what you plant here. Well, what I did here is, again, is I'm using the different textures. We have all different textures and all different colors. So no matter what angle you look at, one plant is playing off the other plant. For example, we have the icebreaker here, which is mm -hmm. playing off the, the uh, piccola, which is playing off of the dahlia. Okay. So we've got three different things. So if we looked at it from different angles, we're getting different, a different look because they're playing off right. of a different plant and a different texture. So And different than if, like you talked about, in a line... It's right. a totally different look, not as interesting. Right, because if you look at that from front or behind, all you're seeing, you're focusing, because you're, as a human beings, our eyes will always focus on color. So we'll focus on the brightest color and not the other plants that are with it. Right, right. So we want them to play off of each other. That's why we want to stagger them. The other thing it does is it adds depth to, mm, the, to the bed. Sure. So if you have a straight fence with a straight line, they're all symmetrical. Right. You're not getting that depth. If you stagger them, then it makes the, the bed look bigger than it actually is. That is true. And then um, what about, like, we always hear about the bones of the garden and, you know, starting with that possibly, and do you believe in that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. The best place to start is your foundation plants. Mm. Now, for example, this Acer Shear Swanum Arium is our foundation plant here. So we have a certain color and a certain texture. So what we want to do is play off of this color. One, one good uh, color to play off of this is a blue. So we've got the Picea pungent nim nimits next to it and then the icebreaker. Pretty. The great thing that, and another important thing to do is all, all my customers know is I'm a huge believer in 12 month color. Sure. So the best thing about this is when some of the, the dormant perennials are gone, we still have the evergreen, so we still have color in the bed. And if you space it right, it still looks full in the middle of January as it, as it does in June. So. You start with your foundation plant like the surest one. And then I went to the Picea pungent nimits here, which is a great uh, dwarf blue spruce that's still flushing out some of its color from the spring, but it flushes out this bright buttery yellow new color in the spring and then turns blue for the rest of the year. So it kind of evolves. So then when we get into fall, the surest swanum will turn a pumpkin orange, which is playing off the icebreaker and playing off the nimits. Right. So again, different season, but we still have all the different colors and that's very, very important. So you start with your foundation plant and then start building down from there. The last thing you're gonna do is like this Veronica that's out front. Mm -hmm. Those would be your last three things that you do as you're kind of scaling down 
and building your, your, your garden. So foundations are, plants are very important. Our foundation plants here, like I said, would be the Shiraswanum, the Picea pungens, mm -hmm. Nimitz, the uh, Icebreaker, Icebreaker, and the Societopides piccolo over there. Those would be our foundation plants. The Kaleidoscope and the uh, Mahonia are also would be our foundation plants. Then the perennials like the dahlias and the veronicas and the astilbe, those would be our, our seasonal color. And it's so nice because there's broadleafed evergreens in the abelia and in the mahonia, and then the needled evergreens, and then the deciduous, because you're still going to have that texture of the branches even in wintertime. Right, absolutely. So that's going to be really nice. And then even if in the wintertime you could put in pansies or other kind of winter interest annuals, just to kind of get some more color for the winter time. Right, and that's exactly why you want to stagger things as much as you can, because then you have room to put your annuals right. or your seasonal plants. If you put them all in a straight line, you really don't. Right. So that's why that's super important to try and remember, if you have the space to do it. Um, if you have a really small bed where it's really short and narrow, you know, you can still do it to a certain extent, but use smaller plants and just kind of, you know, do as much staggering as you can because it makes a huge difference. Oh, it is. It's, you know, all these tips are so good. And if you come out to French Prairie Perennials, you can do this in their yard here. I mean, there's space. You can like recreate what you're going to take home, take pictures. It's so much easier then to bring it home and install it and you're all done and your garden looks gorgeous and it's professionally from Rick Naylor. <laughs> oh, well, we do it all the time here in the, in the, people will bring us pictures of their space from home and then we'll give them some ideas of what plant material to use and then we'll lay it out here in the parking lot and we'll kind of make changes as we go because I'm a very visual person also which is how visual scaping got started right, right. in the first place but so sometimes I have to see things laid out and sometimes I'll say yeah that's not what I thought it was going to be and we'll make that change right. into something that's, that's a little bit better but it works really well because people will take pictures of what we've laid out take it home and then we'll space it out exactly the way it was here and then I'll try to remember it and everything else so right. it works out really well Right. That way. Well, really, such a gr fun thing to do, and you get involved in it. It's not just someone doing a drawing. So please come out to French Prairie Perennials, talk to Rick, and really have a beautiful landscape at your house. Thanks so much. Thanks, Judy. Appreciate it. Garden Time is brought to you by Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. Hi, I'm Sarah with Portland Nursery where our passion for plants has kept us rooted in this incredible community. A lot has changed since we first opened our doors, but through it all, we've remained family owned and operated, dedicated to providing our neighbors the largest selection of the highest quality plants Portland has to offer. With hundreds of new plants arriving each week, you're guaranteed to find something exciting and unique. Portland Nursery, a passion for plants at 50th and Stark, 90th and Division. You can use water wisely this summer with these simple tips. Periodically, check your watering system to make sure it is working correctly. Tighten hose connections and adjust sprinklers to water plants and not the pavement. Give your lawn and garden a deep soak twice weekly instead of watering daily. Skip the fertilizer until the fall and mow your lawn less often. Taller grass holds moisture in longer between waterings. Get more water-wise gardening tips at regionalh2o.org. Since 1982, the wall has been making local gardens beautiful, naturally. Whether you need a new wall, concrete patio, fire pit, or driveway, the wall's expert craftsmen can build it. We back up our work with a five-year warranty so you'll know it'll last. We use the highest quality materials, including stamped colored concrete, natural stone, and we're the leader in using recycled concrete. Create an outdoor environment you'll enjoy for years with the help of your friends at The Wall. We're down here at Oregon State University. I'm with Dana. Dana, today we are talking moles, voles, and gophers. Awesome. And there are, you know, you were telling me a little earlier, I didn't realize there were so many different varieties of moles. There are. Uh, we have here in the state of Oregon up to four different species of moles. In the Willamette Valley, though, we'll primarily be able to encounter the largest bodied species, which is the Townsends. And then, you know, 
there's there's differences between those, but you know, between a vole and a mole, I think there's mm -hmm. a lot of confusion as to what the difference between those. Oh, two. absolutely. Um, voles are the little guys that we see that frequently get called field mice. They work both on the surface and also below ground in little tunnels, and they eat vegetation, specifically herbs like grass and forbs. Although they do get in trouble for chewing on uh, young shrubs and the bark of young trees and things like that. Whereas our moles are actually hunters. They are tracking down earthworms primarily, grubs, slugs, uh, beetle larvae, other, uh, let's call them bugs, <laughs> that are living in the soil. And so they burrow in order to find their prey. Okay. And then what about gophers? I mean, I think of caddyshack when I think of gophers. <laughs> yeah, caddyshack type gophers are also, so depending on the species, they're either eating a combination of plant material or and or seeds, and it also depends on the, the uh, time of year what they'll be eating. And people often get the gopher hills and the mole hills mixed up. Uh, because what you're seeing in each case is just a big explosion of dirt on the surface of your lawn, potentially. Right. And, you know, when you see those big, big mouths, can you kind of tell, you know, from which critter down below is, is pushing that up? You can if it's fresh, and that's really the key to it, is to get out there and look at it before your dog checks it out, or the kids, or rain and sun and things like that. In fresh soil that's been thrown out of the ground by one of these animals, you can tell by where they quit digging, there will be a little plug that actually starts to fall back into the hole. And if that plug is at the edge of what we'd call a fan of dirt, then that would be a gopher hole. And if the plug is right in the middle, I like to remember mole in the middle, uh, if that plug's right in the middle of a more conical pile of dirt, that's a mole hill. Okay. And, you know, and a lot of times, you know, people plant bulbs in their yard and say, mm -hmm. oh, the moles ate my bulbs. Is, are mm -hmm. they actually down there eating bulbs or they're you know them? they might have a chomp or two at that that's possible with the larger bodied species we have here in the willamette valley it tends to uh, be more of an incidental thing uh, they're burrowing along going after those worms and keeping your grubs down and then oh here's a nice fleshy plant fruit for me to chomp on and then they'll keep going but to the person who owns that bulb, it may not be so right. incidental. But, but there are, you know, we're talking some benefits of, of these. There's not, they're not always a, a horrible thing to have in your yard. No, they aren't. They actually are performing an important ecosystem service that we don't even see below the surface. They're aerating the soil. They're moving nutrients down from the lower levels back up to our growing zone for our plants. And they're also aerating to help water infiltrate and soak through the soil. So if we can tolerate them, it's not a bad thing. So That's if we, right. you know, maybe just to remove the move the hill, is that the best way if we want to keep We can. In? If the hill is really causing a problem, either it's unsightly or it's fouling your equipment, you could just spread the, the dirt out. Um, it'll bring some of that nice aerated fluffy soil to the surface and so, let it blend in. Right. You know, so there's there's so much information on, you know, moles, bulls and gophers that I had no idea there was yep. that that many around. You know, mostly right. we just see the mountains and the and the tunnels and get yep. irritated, but there's def definitely some benefits of having those. There are some unsung benefits to those right. guys. Yes. You know, so you know, for more information on the moles, bulls and gophers, make sure you go to the Oregon State University Extension's website or you can go to gardentime.tv and we'll click you over. So Dana, it's been a pleasure learning all about moles, bulls and gophers and uh, you know, I know I have them in my yard. I might just rethink what I think about them. Now. All right. Great. Thank you. As gardeners, we have a lot of black plastic pots laying around our garden. Well, I'm with Ed from Fishing Hem Gardens. And so, Ed, you have come up with a great way to kind of recycle these black plastic pots. What'd you do? Well, um, I had some tender seedlings, uh, some tomato seedlings that I was concerned would get burned in the hot sun. So what I did was I took a pot like you have in your hand and I cut it in half and drilled some holes in the, the top mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. and used um, landscape staples 
to secure it in the soil. And this way, uh, the seedlings get morning sun, but uh, the, new, the hot noon and afternoon sun they're protected from. And that is such a great idea. And it's something that we can just use that's around the house. We don't have to go out to the store and really some ingenuity and just a little bit of uh, chores. And you have a great solution to that problem. Exactly, yeah. And the plants look great, good, they're growing well and they are protected until they get um, to be a good size and then you could take it off. Right, yes. Uh, well, thanks so much for that tip. I think that's a good one that we can pass along for everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks. Welcome to Blooming Junction, where it's easy to connect with nature. At Blooming Junction, you'll find beautiful, healthy plants, good, fresh food, and a place to regain peace and calm in your life. We have an unsurpassed collection of unique and distinctive plants and the expertise to help any gardener be successful. And we feature Blooming Advantage plants. Come check out Blooming Junction for an inspiring experience in the garden or in the kitchen. Blooming Junction, offering quality plants for beautiful gardens. Ryan, you need to brush up your look. Ryan, that is better. It's always better when you show off your Garden Time pride. Check out the Garden Time store on our webpage for a great selection of Garden Time gifts and apparel. Choose a hoodie, shirt, hat, bag, or mask for yourself or as a gift for the Garden Time fan in your life. See the complete selection on the Garden Time website. Pick up some Garden Time gear and show your Garden Time pride. Since 1929, Grimm's Fuel has powered great gardens around our area. With our comprehensive composting and yard debris services, we can apply quality garden mulch, compost, and blended soils with our experienced crews and trucks, including our landscape rock and bark products as well. We're proud of our industry-leading state-of-the-art composting facilities. We also can take care of your fuel oil and firewood needs. Grimm's Fuel, building great gardens since 1929. Well, we're out the Lansu Chinese Gardens, and I'm with Justin. And Justin, we come down to the gardens often and view the beautiful flowers, um, you know, throughout the seasons. But there's so much more to the gardens in there, as far as symbolism. Yeah, I mean, plants are represented everywhere in the garden, not just the physical form of the plant. Uh, we see it in the architecture. We see it in the pathways. We also see it in the poetry. So, and just about every element of the garden uh, plant is represented. And you know, and as we're walking through the gardens, what kind of areas or where should we be looking, you know, besides just the actual, actual plants? Uh, so when you first walk into the garden, if you look up to the, uh, the, the roof gable of our, uh, our four-sided pavilion, um, you'll see a pomegranate and a peach in the architecture. Okay. And the peach is a representative of longevity. And unfortunately, we don't have any peaches in the garden. Uh, but also we have a pomegranate represented and that uh, is a representative and a symbol of fertility. And we actually do have a couple of pomegranates in the garden as well. You know, and so, and in walking through some of these courtyards, you see a lot of stonework on, on the grounds. And then what kind of symbolism is that showing? Um, yeah, so if you uh, go to our fragrance courtyard area of the garden, uh, the stone uh, design in the pathway is of a lotus. And lotus are, you know, they bloom in the summer, they grow in the water. And so therefore that courtyard is a symbol of summer. And then when we walk into the uh, scholar's courtyard after that, we have the opposite. We have plum blossoms falling on cracked ice is the motif uh, on the pathway there and you can see this almost looks like a modern design but it's actually a very very old classic design of these plum blossoms that have fallen and cracked the ice bringing uh, in spring and putting it into winter. Interesting and you know and there's you know various spots throughout the garden of these you know little rooms and little vignettes that you're looking through you know windows and cutouts and yes. there's there's symbolism in there too. Yes uh, so our, our leak windows um, are throughout the garden and there's very, uh, there's hundreds of uh, different uh, uh, designs in those. We have hollyhock, we have camellia, we have peony, um, to, just to name a few. 
Um, and so just about every single one of them is, is unique and they, um, they filter your view from one part of the garden to another so that it, you have this illusion of more space and, uh, and to know that there's more to see just around the corner. And you had mentioned too, you talked about you know, poetry and how poetry is kind of a big part of, of the gardens, how some of the symbolism may, may tie in with poetry. Well, this is a scholar's garden, and the scholar uh, in the Ming dynasty uh, would have been a poet, a calligrapher, um, an artist, uh, as well as a politician. And so the poetry would be represented throughout the garden as, as a, um, an element that you must have. And uh, also it talks about what is either in the garden or what is in nature. So it reminds you that you're either in the mountains or uh, reminds you of something you're about to see. You know, we have poetry that talks about the plums when they're in bloom. And we have uh, poetry that talks about the, the pine and the bamboo. So we're always kind of reminded of, of, of that there's a connection between not just the living plant, but the other, other elements as well. You know, and as people are walking through, you'll, they may miss a lot of these elements if they don't know what, what to look for. So if somebody's to take a tour of the gardens, what is the best way for them to kind of know where all this meaning is and, and how, to, how to find it? Um, we, right now we have a new app called Discover Lan Su, and you can download it either before your visit or there's a, a QR code you can point your phone <laughs> at. And so we have some, um, some audio tours and some uh, uh, video tours of the garden that talk about uh, a lot of the, the elements that I'm talking about right now. Very nice. You know, so there's just so much more to the gardens than you might not, you know, interpret just walking around. You know, the, the flowers on the plants are, you know, stunning. You know, every season is something different and blooming. But there's just so much more that you can do at the gardens. So make sure you visit the Lonsu website or you can go to garden.tv for more information and experience the full beauty of the gardens. So appreciate it, Justin. Thank you. Thank you. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. At Capital Subaru, we are family. It's not all about selling cars here. It's about our community and our families. We keep you moving. With a Subaru, it's always, what are you going to do next? And with our new space, we'll get you service faster than ever before. And we are growing. With over 72,000 square feet and 30 new service bays. Our new location is opening later this spring. I can't wait, it's a new year and it's gonna be awesome. At Capital Subaru, we are your way on the parkway. Judy, what are you doing? You said to follow you. Follow us on Facebook. Oh. Well, we invite all of our viewers to follow the Garden Time page on Facebook. And on our Facebook page, you'll find links to stories, you'll see upcoming events, and you also might even find a funny joke or two. So don't forget, go to the GardenTime.tv webpage and click the link for Facebook. Since 1926, the Bonite Company has worked with homeowners to make their homes and gardens beautiful. If you have a garden problem, Bonite has the answer. Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew controls most common garden insects and is derived from a naturally occurring bacteria to help with your organic gardening. It's safe to use even on fruits and vegetables. Visit Bonide.com to find a local retailer and to download your free Bonide Problem Solver app for your iPhone or Droid. Well, it is all about fuchsia plants today at Blooming Junction, and I'm with Ron. And Ron, I can't believe how many you have on those tables over there. How many? We have about 50 varieties of fuchsias, hardy fuchsias. That is just amazing. It's just an ocean in the shade house there. It's it is. pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, it is. It's incredible. So you picked out some of them, and yeah. so let's talk about them. Okay, I picked out some because I found them to either be um, their new varieties, oh or interesting varieties, um, beautiful colors, contrast and size, and we'll just go down the row and, and talk good. about them. This one's called Lottie Hobby. It gets about uh, oh, a foot and a half tall, kind of spreading, a uh, cute little fuchsia flower on it. Um, this one here is a Groen's 
cons. Um, this is a, a rather new one. This will get about 30 inches and it's just got a beautiful wow. um, orangey, peachy color. That's really color. unusual. It is very unusual. Um, this one's called Cat Jan here. Aww. This one gets a couple feet tall and you'll see it's so got a tiny. very a small, tiny little flower. So much diversification. Really cool. There really is. There's a lot um, uh, of diversity in the leaf size. Um, the speciosa over there by you, this one? Um, yes, has a rather large leaf. Mm -hmm. um, that's a beautiful plant. Um, that one's been around for quite a while. Very nice. Uh, this one here is called a Golden Herald, and this has got uh, you know the beautiful golden contrast to the leaf, plus your classic fuchsia flower. Um, a lot of people like this um, here. The hummingbirds must just have a blast here. They are so well fed. Yes, there's a lot of hummingbirds out in the shade house. Um, this one is an interesting one. This is called Erecta. Um, and this one uh, doesn't necessarily have a pendulous flower like uh, most of the fuchsias do. It's more erect, that's the name. Yeah, very cool. Um, this one right here is a double auto. Whoa. Um, this is your classic fuchsia, but this one has just an enormous flower on it. Um, this is one of my favorites. This gets about uh, two to three feet tall. And really, they bloom all summer? All summer. In fact, you know, when people ask me for something um, that blooms all summer in, in part shade to shade, uh, fuchsias are usually where we go because they just continue to bloom all season long. And then what about um, their care, though? Um, there's a little bit different planting. That's yeah, kind of a um, newer idea. You know, um, I'm, I'm of the belief that you can plant your fuchsias low. Uh, not quite as low maybe as a tomato plant, but lower than you would uh, normal plants. Um, I think it protects in the wintertime, too, and it conserves water. Um, and it also will accept a little bit more sun that way uh, and with mulching. Um, my fuchsias at home uh, accept dry shade. Uh, I don't really water that area in the summertime, oh. and they do very well. That is cool. And so that would take a couple years to get a really nice root Right, fall. right. That's really interesting, though. I mean, it kind of expands where we can put them in the garden. That's right. Sure does. Um, here we have uh, Yolanda Frank. Um, this is a beautiful one here. Um, I like the, the contrast in so the, the petals there. Um, and then this is um, one of the DeBrons. This one's a smoky blue. Wow. Um, this is a rather new one too. Um, that's just a beautiful one there. A little more upright. Yeah, and this is, uh, this is Fusionade 88. And I love <laughs> this one for the color. It wow, just got your, striking. a fuchsia color. It's a beautiful, beautiful flower. You know, we so love them in baskets, but to have them in a ground or even in a container, we can do that? They do great in containers, yeah. That is nice. Well, you know, this is such a beautiful place to come, you know, come out for a drive, get out of the city and come out and enjoy the fresh air and the sunshine and get a fuchsia. If you have any other questions, please go to Garden Time and we'll click you over to Blooming Junction website. Thanks so much, Ron. Thank you. You may have noticed that your geraniums and your petunias are getting munched on. And here are two examples of the favorite plants for geranium budworm, geraniums and petunias. And the geranium budworm is actually a larva of a moth. And that's what um, is eating the flowers. And it actually takes on the color of the flower. So sometimes they're very hard to see. You may also notice that it looks like dirt on the leaves and it's actually their droppings, which is called frass. And you may also notice that at, on a bud, you'll find a little hole down at the bottom where it's been nibbling. And so what will that will prevent the flower from opening up because it's damaged that flower. So it's a great product you can use. This is a, from Bonide. This is called Captain Jack's Bed Bug Brew. And this is a natural product. You can tell from the brown little label up in the corner. And what this will do is you can spray it on the plant every you know, two to three weeks. It'll prevent and kill that, the bugs or like the caterpillars. And it also will take care of spider mates. So this is a quick and easy tip to get rid of the geranium budworm.
Come to where the color is. Come to Egan Gardens. We've worked hard growing healthy plants for you so that your gardening is easy. Add sparkle to your garden with our perennials, container plants, and skillfully designed baskets and planters. Stop and get a mood lifter out here on the farm. We have lots of fresh air and lots of space. There's lots of blooming plants, new vegetable starts, shrubs, and berry bushes. Egan Gardens, where it's all about the plants. We're located west of I-5 at exit 263 on River Road. Located in the heart of Willamette Valley's hops, hazelnut, and wine country, Caddy Farms is a beautiful option for your upcoming wedding or event. Enjoy the diverse venue the over 40-acre farm offers with manicured gardens, a private forest and spacious meadow, chef's kitchen, and covered patios. All just five minutes off of I-5 in Aurora, Oregon. Ketty Farms, now booking upcoming events. DRAM is celebrating 75 years of design and manufacturing of quality watering tools. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. DRAM for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. At Sagawa Nursery, we always talk about taking your garden from ordinary to extraordinary. For us, that means bringing you the newest and best plants and unique garden items to you, our customer. For you, that means we'll help you transform your garden into something that's extraordinary. We also have some great gift items and even a few surprises for inside your home, too. Sagawa Nursery, growing beyond the ordinary. Join us for Berries, Brews, and Barbecue, now happening three weekends in June, featuring Oregon Craft Ciders and Brews and Barbecue. Enjoy barbecue. You pick strawberries, hay rides, live music, and much, much more. It's farm fun for the whole family at French Prairie Gardens. I'm here today with Dr. Tom Smiley from the Bartlett Research Lab, and today we're standing in front of the beautiful garden which is full of boxwood hedges and you know a lot of us have heard about boxwood blight what is boxwood blight yes boxwood blight is a fungal disease it's relatively new to the pacific northwest and it can be absolutely devastating to a boxwood garden like this one and it's actually gotten into this garden uh, and is starting to cause some problems so what what is the blight what, what do we uh, the blight is a fungus that will attack uh, first the foliage and it will give us spots on the foliage and then it will move into the stems and it gives us black lesions on the stems. Uh, it will continue down the stems until it kills the whole plant if it's left untreated. So that would be some of the symptoms then would be kind of this, this discoloring or spotting on the leaves and the stems. And then yes. you said, does it defoliate the plant or does it just kill it? Or? Yes, that's one of the ways that you can distinguish this disease from many other boxwood diseases. And boxwood gets a lot of diseases and has right. other problems. Uh, but this one will cause defoliation in the summer. A lot of times with boxwood uh, diseases, the leaves are retained dead for a while. With this one, they drop during the growing season. Is there, and where, where does it come from? I mean, how does, it, how does uh, a plant get It came there? from uh, Europe originally and then uh, is transmitted around. One of the most common ways it's transmitted is with new plants into the garden. So uh, there were some nurseries a decade or more ago that were selling some contaminated plants and it's kind of contaminated the whole Pacific Northwest with those wow. plants. Uh, and then so that you get one new plant in the garden and it can spread to the rest of the garden. So is it spreading just by airborne or how does it? Yeah, so these spores are very sticky. So when you walk through the garden and you brush up against a plant with your clothes or your pruning tools or even your dog, uh, the spores will stick to those uh, surfaces oh, wow. and then you touch another plant that's healthy and you've just put the spores on it. So you have to be very careful, especially when pruning. Uh, if you're gonna do your whole garden, start with the healthy plants first. Finish with these, always in the day, 
Uh, and if you're moving from garden to garden, you need to protect your clothes or change clothes uh, because, quite honestly, landscapers can spread this uh, by accident as well. And it's probably important to sanitize your, your pruning tools or all your tools. Yes, you all your tools, uh, yes. And, and even carrying out debris. The debris should be bagged at the site uh, and don't drop leaves. Don't drag it like you would a tree branch. Right. Uh, it all has to be contained. So you don't want to put it in your yard debris or your compost it because it'll spread. So Correct. make sure you bag it and then put it in, in more in the landfill. Yeah, I'm sorry to say, but landfill it, yeah. Um, and same with the whole plant, a whole dead plant, bag it on site, don't drag that soil anywhere. Put it in a the bag, then it goes to the landfill. So if, we, you know, we've, if we've determined that we do have a boxwood blight in our, in our garden, what can we do to either prevent it Yes. or to treat what we already have. Yes, so there are a number of different things we should do. One is let's watch out for irrigation. So this is also spread, it's a sticky spore, but it's also splash spread. So uh, irrigation head like this uh, can spread it and it improves the environment. So the environment needs to be wet, which is why it spreads right. in the spring. So when we have rain, that it will spread it. Uh, irrigation, we can control. Uh, so uh, that is one thing. Watch our irrigation. Uh, drip is better than okay. overhead. Um, pruning. We'd like to open up the, the hedge if we can. We don't want it too tight because the tighter it is, the less air circulation. Okay. So if we can prune so there are some openings in the hedge, that's going to let it dry out. Uh, then the real big gun is the fungicide programs. Okay. And uh, fungicides can be very effective with this disease as well as most other plant diseases. Uh, but we need to do fairly frequent applications ranging from about two to four weeks between application depending on the material you're using. Right. And I know Bartlett has, has services that will come out yes. and, and treat that and they can identify it and, and put people on a treatment plan. Yes, absolutely right. And, and you can do it yourself uh, as well if your landscape isn't too large. Right. <laughs> you know, so there is some over-the-counter Yes. Or that you can pick up at your local garden center. Right, your garden good. center can guide you to the right fungicide. To do that. So, yes. so it sounds like you know, it's very important you know, to maybe catch it earlier. Are there preventative measures uh, that we can use? Absolutely. So one preventative uh, measure, if you're bringing new boxwood into your garden, plant them off to the side uh, for the first season. Make sure they're not blighted because the nursery people, they don't want to sell you contaminated right. plants, but sometimes they don't know either. Right. So plant it off to the side, then move it into your garden the next season when you know that it's clean. Right. And so if we have a hedge that, you know, has has blighted and they've removed sections of that hedge yes. and they want to replant that yes. area. Is that an okay thing uh, or do they need to be? Yeah, it, it's okay, but you really have to keep an eye on that. And then the fungicide programs, again, can be very effective uh, at keeping it down. I think we'll show you some examples in this garden uh, where they have pruned to start with pruning out right. the, the blighted material, then put it on a fungicide program. And we have really good response. Uh, right. Boxwoods are incredible. Incredibly tough plants. Right, they're they're a very resilient plant. They but it sure does sounds like it's important to stay stay on top of it and you know follow follow a lot of the tips that you have. Yes. You know, some more of the tips. You know, you can go to the GardenTime.tv website. We'll kick it over to the Bartlett site where they have more information on this. And you know, it's one of those we love our boxwoods here we in the do. Northwest. <laughs> You're yeah, such a great plant. Yes. We just want to make sure we keep our hedges healthy. Absolutely. So thank you for all the information. Thank you. Is your garden getting tired? Don't let your garden fizzle out because of the summer heat. Stop by Wavra Farms for a refresher in summer color. We carry a great selection of plants that love the summer. Give your garden the splash of color that it deserves. Your outdoor entertaining will be more enjoyable when you are surrounded by beautiful plants, wonderful flowers, and great fragrance. Let us show you what a summer garden should be. Wavra Farms, just east of Salem, off Highway 22 at the Joseph Street exit. DRAM is celebrating 75 years of design and manufacturing of quality watering tools. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. DRAM for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. Garden time is on the road again. Join us as we tour Portugal and Spain in the fall of 2021. We start in Lisbon where we tour the palaces and gardens of royalty. 
Then we make our way across Spain with visits to the Mesquita and the world-famous Alhambra. Enjoy the sights, sounds, and tastes of Andalusia before we end up in exciting Madrid. Local transportation, hotels, and 26 of your meals are included. Go to Garden Time Tours for more information, and we'll see you in Europe. I'm out here at Little Baja I'm with Jared. Jared, you know, we always think of Little Baja as pottery and statuary, but pinatas? Right, good question. <laughs> uh, we get calls all the time uh, wondering, do you guys sell pinatas? Yeah. So um, how did you get into, into pinatas? Yeah, uh, 30 something years ago, we were looking for a way to kind of uh, fill all the space on the trailer. Uh, if you, it, you could quickly exceed the weight limit with just pottery. Right. Uh, so, uh, we, so when we'd bring uh, pottery up from Mexico, uh, we'd make a point to fill the last two feet of the truck complete with pinatas, kind of help the family down there and wholesale them all around the Northwest. Right. And you guys don't typically deal with like big factories, so. No, yeah. Small family, artisan made, authentic. This is a real thing. Right. And you have, you know, a whole room. Yeah, and it, yeah. What, Mr. Mr. Pinata is you're working with, right? Exactly, exactly. Always new choices coming in all the time. Right. And you know, the themes, you can do pretty much anything. Yeah, yeah. Great for uh, any occasion and any age. Right. So, you know, we're out, outdoors entertaining this time of year, which, which is great. And you were, had little suggestions for how to use the pinatas. Yeah, right? certainly. Uh, three pounds of goodies is the right amount of filling. Uh, you want it to be supported by the metal wire that it hangs from and not get too heavy. Um, and we recommend a plastic bat to break it open. And why a plastic bat? Well, there's way too many <laughs> videos online and people getting whacked with a broomstick or something. So we'll, we'll save that for the internet and just take a whack with the plastic bat instead. Right. You know, so if you're looking for a pinata, make sure you walk on down here to Little Baja and check out their pinata selection. So Jared, it's great to be down here. We'll come and get our pots or pottery or statuary and pick up a pinata or two while we're down here. <laughs> right on. Garden Time's Incredible Edibles. Well, it's strawberry season, you know, a lot of us think of shortcake, but you know, it's also fun to take those strawberries and decorate them a little bit and make a fun project for your friends, your family, or your kids. So a lot of us will take and just use the you know, traditional, either just dip them in whipped cream, which is always good, or like Judy has over there, you can just dip them in straight chocolate. And so what we have is just melted chocolate here, and it's really so easy. You just kind of coat the strawberry with chocolate, and then sprinkles. It's such a great idea. There's candy sprinkles, shredded coconut, or uh, chopped nuts. And look how pretty this is. It's just really kind of special for your really special occasion. You know, and other things you could use, you could use frosting. So we've used some colored frosting. So say you want to use something for 4th of July, you could dip this in like this white frosting here. You get it all white. And then when you're done, you could take some blue fr blue frosting and just kind of drizzle that over the top and you have a 4th of July or any other holiday item you can use. Oh, that's a great idea. You know, just a couple tips that you can do with your family and friends and just have some more fun with strawberries this season. Well, nothing says summer like a sunny size and big tropical plants. And I'm with Rosie down at n and And Rosie, you have some really cool plants down here. Hi, Ryan. How are you? Welcome. So <laughs> Thank what, what you. Do, what do we have today? Okay, so these are tropicals that just, I call them simply a wow plant. And so for something to go from this right here to this in one season. Really? Yes, right there. Wow, and that, is, that is a wild plant, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And they're really, really easy. Most tropicals will take sun or shade, and um, they just go from the, you know, going like crazy. And so, are you are people putting these in pots or containers or in the yard or what's you know where's the best places to put these? Well, I always say the more the better. <laughs> put them in all your pots and containers. I love them in pots. I love them in the yeah. ground wherever you want a real uh, tropical spot, just put one of these, and they're just really, um, they give you so much bang for your buck. I mean, it's def definitely a statement. Oh, absolutely, piece. and just that they're so easy and. Yeah, I mean, you have um, tons of big mixed containers full yes. of, with these in the center with all the color around yeah, it that uh -huh. they're, they are making that scene. Yeah, this is a really good thriller. Yeah, so, and what are, so what are these guys over here? These are colocasias. And these, um, the leaves point down, 
and they are generally in the darker colors and they these take the full sun or full shade so okay. plant them anywhere and then the alocasias these, kind of these guys right guys here, here these, these three right yes i tell people that they prefer afternoon shade they'll be okay in full sun but they kind of have that weathered look okay they will kind of yes. you know, burn out a little bit exactly. and then these leaves looks like they're pointing more yeah. upright exactly yeah now are these you know is one hardier than the other you know yeah no well they're the alocasias actually after a season they make an excellent house plant okay yes yeah, okay. very very easy and they get huge, so you better have a spot yeah, Obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, but um, the, the colocaceous, they have to go dormant. So right. for this to winter over, you would need to protect it somehow. We do have one variety, this pink china, it comes back on its own. That's the only true hardy uh, colocacea that I know of. It looks like, you know, you get different combinations. You know, you have the red stems and these with the green foliage oh. or red stems and purple foliage and you know, very modeled yeah. in different looks. This, this illustrious is one of our favorite just because of what the back stem looks like. And they're just, you know, the more sun they get, the more shinier the leaves are and more color they and you, have. And you could go through and, you know, because it looks like your clump is getting pretty big in one season. So right. if it's in a pot or container and you do winter it over, can you, you divide. Know, divide that Oh, out? absolutely. You can divide it and they grow fast. So it, it's just so fun. And I call them just pure entertainment plants. Right. It's, it just and then you have a couple others, you know, between the alocasias and colocasias, you also have canna lilies. Cannas, And yes. you have a few different varieties over here where this one looks kind of like the, the alocasias or colocasias. So there's cannas and there's bananas. <laughs> there's this and there's that. But this is a canna banana. And okay. so it has the growth habit of um, a banana but the foliage of a canna, this particular variety does not bloom. It's just grown for the Musifolia. foliage. Okay. Yeah, musifolia. And it gets in one year up to 12, 15 oh, feet wow. tall. Yeah, it's spectacular. And the, right next to it is the canna and pretoria. This is the pretoria, which has yes, a beautiful striped. Beautiful, and the beautiful orange flowers. And the cannas will take full sun. The blooming cannas need a little bit more forth. sun than the, just like a canna musifolia, you can put it in sun or shade. And there's, you know, once again, multiple colors as far as leaf colors and bloom colors. Exactly. But also much, much hardier than the alocasias yes. or the colocations. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Much hardier and they bloom from now until frost. Right. So, so it just still, gives me that. So you still get yes. that, you know, that big tropical bold, bold look exactly. and still have it come back. Oh, yes, yes, year yes. After year. Now, you guys are open down here, you know, if people were to come down you know, to find a great selection like this. Is, you know, coming down to the nursery the best place to get these or we're... Well, we're, yes, for now we're open until July 5th and okay. we do a, couple, a few farmers markets, but the, right for now this is the best place to come. And you would have all this information would be on your, on your website yes. as far as yes. your, your dates or where yes. you're open or your yeah. appearances yeah. can be. So. You know, so for a great selection of, you know, some really cool tropicals, some hardies, some non-hardies, you know, different leaf colors, you know, come down to NNM and talk with Rosie and you'll have a great selection and lots of great information. So Rosie, it was a pleasure to be out here. You can go to your website or you can go to gardentime.tv and we'll click you over. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Rosie. <laughs>
From our soil products to our plant foods, we have always been committed to the environment and sustainability. We use a vast array of natural and organic ingredients and package them in our 100% solar powered plant. Look for the quality line of Espoma products at your local independent garden center. Espoma, organic from the beginning. Hey everybody, I'm Brian Bauman from Bauman's Farm and Garden and it's summertime on the farm and there are tons of blooming plants, but oftentimes it's easy to get confusing. For example, this is lobelia. This is kind of what most of us are familiar with. It, we put it in our hanging baskets, pots, containers, it trails, blooms all summer, but it's just an annual. Once the winter comes, it's done. Beautiful, but doesn't last forever. On the other hand, these are also lobelia. I know they look different, same name, but completely different plant. Both of these are perennials. The red one here will actually go well into freezing during the winter time. It, it kind of dies back during the winter and it comes back up in the springtime. Beautiful red flowers, hummingbirds love it. The bees, great for all of our pollinators and it comes back every single year. The blue one is actually brand new this year. Beautiful dark blue color, same kind of thing. It's gonna go well into frost, I'd say 20s no problem during the winter time. So Western Oregon's great. Eastern Oregon, this might be a little harder coming back. Blooms throughout the summer. A lot of times I like to pinch them back once the blooms are done so that it keeps re-blooming. Super hardy. We have this hardy lobelia in blue and red right now on the farm. Come on down to the farm and to keep up on all the plants that are blooming throughout the summertime, make sure you follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. We'll keep you up to date on what's coming in throughout the summertime. A few weeks ago, we were talking about compost and mulch and about the benefits of having it in your garden. And we were talking with Jeff Grimm from Grimm's Fuel. So, you know, that is so wonderful. And we want to get that done because we all want to relax in our gardens. But Jeff, we need to talk about this facility because this was really a long time coming. Welcome back, Judy. Yeah, we started composting on this facility in 1982. Wow. And back in those days, you know, we just kind of ground things up and we put it out in the pile and we turned it a few times and hoped for the best. Right. Well, things have really changed a lot in the industry. That method, you know, we couldn't control the important composting parameters. So with the new system, uh, it, it's called an aerated static pile composting system. You guys have been here and seen that as we've progressed yeah. over the, over the the last few years, yep. Yeah, and so now we put the compost in beds and we blow air up through them. That's what the fans are that we see. And the pipes, we blow air up through the compost or suck air uh, through the compost. And that way we can control the moisture, the temperature, and the oxygen level in the piles. And so when we can control those variables, it makes for a great compost, for one, and it, it makes the bugs very happy. And happy bugs are odor-free bugs. And so the facility has changed a lot. When you were here years ago, you know, sure. we had, there was an odor in the neighborhood, right? Right. Now there's an odor, it's just much less, and it's much more earthy, much more pleasant than the old compost mountain odors. Right, but you could do it so much faster. I mean, I have a compost, a little bin, and it takes like over a year to get compost, but you can do it so much faster now. That's true, the old method, you know, was four to six months to make compost. Now it sits on these beds for 15 days, we monitor the temperature constantly. After 15 days, we flip the compost over and rewater it and keep it on the beds for another 15 days where we're blowing air and pulling air through the compost pile. And then we'll take it over to the screen and screen the compost with that 5 8 minus that you see and have in your garden. Yeah. And Jeff, to get to this point, there was really a partnership um, among many different kinds of groups. That's true. A lot of, it took a lot of effort, a lot of people coming together and putting their heads together and figuring out the best way to go with this facility. Since we've been here since 1982, we're kind of an integral part of the region and the region's solid waste facility. Uh, Metro and DEQ are kind of in charge of, you know, these solid waste facilities couldn't lose us. You know, we just provide too valuable of a resource for the uh, system. And so we were getting some pushback because of the odors from the neighbors. Metro got everybody together 
hired a contractor to come in and kind of analyze the situation and see what might work for the site. And we, from that they developed a plan and we took the plan and we massaged the plan and ultimately hired a contractor to help us construct this facility. So Metro was very instrumental in getting all the players to come together and they were kind of a referee between us and the neighbors. Out of the system, you know, out of the whole process, you know, several things have come up, but one of the main things is the relationship with the neighbors. There's some really nice neighbors that you know, we knew and it was kind of an adversarial relationship before. That relationship I feel much better about and the neighbors were real nice folks and they just wanted the situation to get better. We spent a lot of time, money and effort to make the situation better and I think they're real happy with the results. It is nice because you wanted to have a good result of all of that and so that's really nice that it all came together. It's a, it's a happy ending which it, it, that's what everyone wanted. Yeah, it really has been a, a, a good story and you know, whenever the government shows up and says, hi, I'm with the government, I'm here to help, you know, you always kind of cringe a little bit. Well, in this case, it really did come true this time. Nice. And so the, the facility is going to be here for many, many years to come. It's going to continue to be an asset for us, the neighbors, the region, the city of Tualatin. They were nice. instrumental in helping us get through these, some of these difficult hurdles yeah. as well. It is good. It's nice to have a happy ending. And if you really need something for your garden, this is the place to come. So please go to gardentime.tv and you can get all the information to come out to Grimm's Fuel. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thanks for coming by. Thank you for watching Garden Time today. And like Ryan, we are so happy that you joined us. And if you're looking for a little something to brighten your day, make sure you come out here to Little Baja. You know, for more information on today's show or any of our other episodes, go to gardentime.tv. Judy and I thank you for watching. We'll see you next week on Garden Time. What are you doing? You said to follow you. Follow us on Facebook. Oh, man. Well, we invite all of our viewers to follow the Garden Time page on Facebook. And on our Facebook page, you'll find links to stories, you'll see upcoming events, and you also might even find a funny joke or two. So don't forget, go to the gardentime.tv webpage and click the link for Facebook. Located in the heart of Willamette Valley's hops, hazelnut, and wine country, Caddy Farms is a beautiful option for your upcoming wedding or event. Enjoy the diverse venue the over 40-acre farm offers, with manicured gardens, a private forest and spacious meadow, chef's kitchen, and covered patios. All just five minutes off of I-5 in Aurora, Oregon. Caddy Farms, now booking upcoming events. Garden time is on the road again. Join us as we tour Portugal and Spain in the fall of 2021. We start in Lisbon, where we tour the palaces and gardens of royalty. Then we make our way across Spain with visits to the Mesquita and the world-famous Alhambra. Enjoy the sights, sounds, and tastes of Andalusia before we end up in exciting Madrid. Local transportation, hotels, and 26 of your meals are included. Go to Garden Time Tours for more information, and we'll see you in Europe. The proceeding was a paid program of the Gustin Creative Group and its sponsors.